it's 2.20. And what we're going to do is open up for any kind of questions that anybody has. So I did save my score. And it looks like that is, though, for like the downloaded version of HyperScore. At what point do you think the um, saving function will be functional in the cloud version? We're working on the development of that. And hopefully it will be by the end of the year, if not sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what the way that the saving works now is you can reopen it. So if you, if you, you should be able to keep five different pieces open in those five safes on okay. the same computer in the same browser, you clear your browser cache or something, those might go away. Um, when you click the download to save button, that's good to have that backup and that will save the file onto your computer. And then you can just drag that back into HyperScore the next uh, iteration that I will make live in the next couple of days will also have an open button. So it's just easier to, to get to the to your saved um, files. Mm -hmm. Those files are not backwards compatible with the old version if you okay. happen to have the old version. However, you can bring some, some files in from the old version into this one, but they may not come in correctly. Come in correctly, sure. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So um, as long as I don't like delete anything, if I yeah. leave this, I should be able to come back to it on my Chrome and it should open back up. Yeah, you should. Um, but if you something that you really like, um, recommend just saving it just in case. Um, yep. Got it. So Sarah, can we ask you, we know in Iowa City Schools, you use Seesaw as your learning platform. Would you be able to save pieces to Seesaw or have the kids access HyperScore through Seesaw and then save in Seesaw? So probably how we would do it is we would put a link to HyperScore through Seesaw. They all have a Google login. So we would probably, and they have their own one-to-one -one device. So we would probably, and we can also use Google Classroom Mm -hmm. um, and we are piloting Canvas for elementary, but we haven't made that switch at the elementary. Um, we probably wouldn't save it in Seesaw, but they could record if it, like if they wanted to play it, they could record their screen of it, but it wouldn't be something they could come back to in Seesaw, if that makes sense. They could just have a recording of it. They could do a screencastify and then send that home to their family. Exactly. One of the things that made me sad is I was the only one who ever heard my students' pieces. Then one day a brilliant kid said, can I just use my phone and record it? And I'm like, yeah, yes, you can. And, and so that was how they, you know, they think of things before I do. But um, oh, I mean, when we switched to Canvas in the secondary, it it was a painful transition, but I ended up seeing it's a very complex program, but because it's complex, you can do a lot of cool things like you, you would be able to save your pieces. Mm -hmm. But do you, um, Lisa, do you use a learning platform in your Boston school? Um, we used, uh, during the first shutdown a year ago, we used exclusively um, Google Classroom. And then this year we used Google Classroom and Seesaw for the younger grades. Um, but I was mostly in person um, oh. because I work with highest needs students and they came back in December. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I work with older students, so I'd be using Google Classroom. One of the things I absolutely loved Google Classroom. It was the greatest way to save things and kids could turn their pieces into me and then pull it back out and work on it and then turn it back into me. That's how we did prior to having to switch to Canvas. That's how we did HyperSport. You can even download. I was messing around that the other day with Peter where I was downloading it and then putting it into a documents folder. And, um, you know, the thing is you're just teaching your students a method for saving and then you constantly say you need to say, everybody stop and say, until and that feature, the, until that feature is there where it automatically saves. Yes, and there's we're working with our backend vendors on coming up with learning management system integrations. So we're going to start with Google Classroom, but actually, even as it is right now, if you're on Chrome OS and you save it, it saves it directly into your Google Drive folder um, there. So that might be if you're on Chrome OS. 
then that might be a very easy way of doing that. Also, once the cloud saving is there, every composition will have its own URL. So oh. you could just share the URLs to share compositions. Um, and we will also have soon the ability to export the audio directly out of Hyperscore. So if you want to send it to somebody without sending them Hyperscore access, that would be there too. So um, earlier you, you mentioned um, that it has the capability of exporting it as traditional notation. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Is it PDF format or is it a format I could import into Sibelius or? It's, it will export MIDI notation, which you can then okay. import into Sibelius. Um, the PDF export will probably take us some time because uh, I haven't found an easy way to do the page layout um, without having to implement it myself. There are no open source libraries that will do the page layout. I can do the notation rendering, but if you want to actually have it not just go off into infinity and um, keep it on a standard page size that that's going to be a tricky part um so how do you how do you export it uh it's not exposed in the version that it, it's not um, you have right now but what okay. will there will be a version where you know, that save button will give you the option to save the hyperscore file save the audio and save the midi okay um and then you'll um, be able to do that uh, get that MIDI there, and then um, you op can open it in Sibelius and, and have the notation. Or Muse um, or yeah. Note Flight or whatever. Yeah. I, if there are other formats that are useful, let us know and, and we can look into doing um, that. I know that like Note Flight, I think, favors Music XML. I haven't really um, been planning on that, but if that's something that's useful, um, but I think the MIDI should be pretty universal. Um, the old version had the media export as well, but there were some um, bugs in it where you had to tweak some things to get it to open in certain programs. Um, and that'll that's fixed in this version. This is, uh, I'm gonna say again, as June is always talking about having your, your community, um, Lisa, my students being non-performance never exported anything. They just basically turned it in and got a grade. So I'm so thankful that you asked that question because I wouldn't have even thought about the fact that you can export it, even though I made a point about it, that you can put it into traditional notation. So thank you for giving Peter that opportunity to talk about that. Yeah, that's usually for me. Because um, mm -hmm. typically what we'll do is I'll do, you know, some exercises using, you know, colors and numbers and we'll come up with, you know, some motives or melodies or something. And then I usually take what we've created and I put it into Sibelius and build things that way because I don't play piano worth anything. So, mm -hmm. but I can write accompaniments. So that's what I do is I, you know, I create the piano parts and everything in Sibelius and turn it into sound files. Um, down the road, we're also looking at integrating notation actually into Hyperscore. So you could view your melody window in standard notation. Oh. Um, that Again, that's a bit harder for a sketch window. Um, mm -hmm. But you, know, you could imagine that you would actually see the notes and they would be in the color of the... I'm going to write that down. So you'll be able to see the notation within the Hyperscore. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a bit down the road, but... <laughs> On our Let list. me put that in the future file. Yes. Okay, I'm writing it future here. I think Lisa's students are very lucky that not only are they getting speech pathology, but they're also getting music. And you are using music as an extra musical tool. And as a music therapist, I really appreciate it. I don't know if you even realize that you're doing music therapy by using music as a tool in your class. Oh, yes. I'm good. That's that's a, that's amazing. I think that's they are so. Actually, lovely. I think uh, I think of what I'm doing as um, more classic um, arts integration. Ah, okay. Because I'm not. I don't think of myself as valuing one side over the other. I'm hoping that they will um, experience uh, growth in both the musical and the linguistic side of the, the puzzle. And even though, of course, it's my job to be targeting their language goals, and that's what I have to put on paper, um, I view this particular venture as, as a true arts integration activity. Um, so arts integration is a great way um, to be using Hyperscore. All right, so um, it's 2.32. We still have some time. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have anything? Um, does uh, anything you want to ask June about the creation? 
program or has been Todd made with the students? Any um, technical questions for Peter, um, Sarah or Lisa, do you have anything that you want Peter or June or myself to know about what you saw today? Now, I'm really excited to start using this with kids. And one of the applications that I've been thinking about is this idea of arts integration. I've been talking about this with Regina Bailey in the arts program that we have in the Iowa City Schools and how we could find different ways to apply music with other forms of art. And I think this is a great tool for doing that. I did a project with a classroom teacher where he wanted to have kids compose themes for storybook characters. And we oh. used a different platform, but this platform would have been really fun um, for that purpose. And so I'm excited to start using this with kids. And you know, we had the same thing that you talked about, Peter. Kids want to draw pictures. It was, you know, we used Chrome Music Lab and they wanted, they were really looking at it more visually rather than thinking about what it sounded like. And when I would play it, it I'd say, well, what do you think of the way it sounds? Oh, I love the way it sounds. And it sounded terrible, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there were some kids who, who really did think about the way it sounded. And so, but thinking about that in terms of that arts integration piece, I think there's a lot here. Um, and so I, I also love the way that you have these separated out, this um, melody window and the harmony window and the way in which they function completely differently. So you have to think about it from a different perspective in, in that sense. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, um, and, and I found that students, once they get into it, they go from that visual thinking to that more schematic thinking mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Where after one or two pieces where they're trying to draw a picture, then they, they get it and then they understand. And then we've had teachers that have developed um, curricula or, or activities that lead into hyperscore to kind of teach that kind of visual thinking about um, storytelling, music, um, before they even get into the software. So drawing activities or using yarn to, to create tension and, and resolution. And, and okay. then they're familiar with that way of approaching that, that way of thinking when they get to the software. How does it look if I am um, on the iPad? I assume that if I was going to be doing it on the iPad, I'd be doing it using... Yes, so I don't have... And I have an older iPad and unfortunately it doesn't work on the older iPad. I know June's been using it on an iPad. Um, I have it on my Chromebook here. Um, so I can, uh, we, one of the main uh, considerations in the redesign was making it more usable for touch displays that the old version you know, didn't run on very many touch devices other than Microsoft Surface and even in it wasn't quite ideal, but, um, and then now I actually looking at, I can't see what I'm doing, but um, yeah, it's very, we try to make it as intuitive as possible. That's why the buttons are a bit larger. It's why we touch friendly. Uh, you can do the pan zoom as you would expect on these devices. So it's, it's definitely geared for touch. Okay. The old version had a lot of um, features like the instruments that were up in very traditional menus and very text-based. And we tried to move that out um, as much as possible. So there's minimal amount of text and everything's kind of right there, like the, the meter um, grid time signature uh, thing, the instruments uh, and the- oh, um, I got it going on my iPad. Oh yeah, great. Great, that looks good. There are a lot of keyboard shortcuts for the program. So I mentioned holding shift to draw a straight line is one of them, but there are actually quite a few, just about everything that you can do, you can do with the keyboard um, as well, but we don't highlight that in this version because we are trying to, to um, make it on equal footing with touch devices where you can't use it, where you may not have a keyboard. Um, but if you press, um, at least on Windows F2, or if you go into the, uh, help menu. Uh, there's a button at the top um, 
for keyboard and it will give you a list of all of the keyboard shortcuts as well. So on a Chromebook, that's kind of useful because you get the best of both worlds with the touch and the keyboard. You know, Lisa, that you could put your kids in front of it. You put your students in front of it and they're going to come up with something just messing around. And so just trying to, to hone in and get them to do what it is that you want them to do. It's, it's but it's so user friendly. Um, that's one of the things that I loved about it so much. And none of my junior high students, uh, somebody asked me this when, when we were talking after we, I sent out the survey, none of my junior high students thought it was, um, it, it was not sophisticated. What the one thing I heard is it looks old, but that's what Peter's fixed now is it doesn't look old anymore. If you can work in black lights mode, you know, that's definitely not old fashioned, but um, I thought that was uh, an interesting thing to note that um, it's, it looks like it belongs to the 21st century now. Okay. Anybody else have anything for the good of the cause? <laughs> okay. So I have many dreams for, for um, what we're going to do with um, Hyperscore and so does June and so does Peter, but we want you to dream with us. We want you to say, I really, uh, you know, this, if only it could do this. And then Peter goes and makes it happen. That would be so cool. I said, that's one of the neatest things is that I have somebody that I can talk to about a feature that I want to see. And your feature might be the exact as, which is always true in the classroom. Everybody else wanted it too. They just didn't, hadn't thought of it yet. So um, we're going to have a YouTube channel and we're going to have a community base so that we can be talking to each other. Somebody does something cool, they can post it. And um, so we know how, how we're using it and how to extend it. So, um, and then we can also provide you, the intention is to let you know anytime, anytime something's updated so that you always know you've got this new tool to work with. Um, you know, that'll be part of my job is to making sure that I'm communicating with you about what's new and fresh in Hyperscore. Does, just, does anybody else have anything? Oh, I just want to add, first of all, thank you, Cece, for an amazing job. And thank you for everybody else for attending today. We really appreciate that. And I also want to say, um, you know, Cece keeps talking about how amazing it is that, you know, she has something she wants and she, she, ha she can communicate directly with Peter about it. Uh, but for us, it's also wonderful to have a community of teachers who mm -hmm. will tell us, I mean, in real time, I mean, it's good. That's how we're going to make this, you know, the best possible product that it can be is having that real world experience and, you know, get, having you tell us what's going to help you do your job better. So, um, so thank you for that too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So in terms of like, um, sort of integrative, you know, instruction, working music into um, different other areas, just not just arts could be any area really is mm -hmm. one of the things that we have done, uh, especially with the city symphony projects is start almost start with an active listening exercise. Uh, it's like showing kids how to like open up a whole sense that, you know, auditory senses don't get the respect they deserve. <laughs> They bring in so much information about the world, but we're such visual creatures, or, you know, that, that we don't realize um, how important that is. So to have kids kind of even close their eyes and just say, what do you hear in the world? Or go home and think, you know, really listen. And it's an amazing experience. I did that with City Symphonies where, you know, I was like, I got to listen. And it's like, it's like suddenly, you know, it's like, being able to hear in, you know, technicolor. <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that's, a, that might be a fun thing to do with kids. And then those, you can have so many different themes. I mentioned, you know, like climate change or something like listening to nature. What does nature in your world sound like? And really pay attention to that and then start using that as material, you know, for, you know, and thinking about it the emotional resonance, you know, why do certain sounds make you feel a certain way? It's really important too, as we try to develop kids' emotional intelligence for them to be able to start identifying and giving names to what they're feeling. So I just wanted to put that out there as <laughs> something we... I'm so glad you did that because um, I have an idea to write a module 
on programmatic music. So like um, Carnival of the Animals that can you hear that that's supposed to be a chicken? Would you, would you pick a chicken or would you pick a lion? And then that's going to give them some opportunities. So when they're actually writing, you said, what would a lion sound like on your piece of music? And how did, how did uh, he get that, uh, promote that sound of a lion? Can you make the sound of a lion? And so then that goes towards your goal of expressing yourself. Um, so that's a module I want to work on. And another one is around, like we were talking early today about how you, know, you played that jazz musician and some people are like, ah, you know, listen to just a little of that. Or, um, I mean, sounds evoke, feelings right that's what why they're so powerful and we're often not conscious of that so people might just say like oh I don't like that but it's much more interesting to say what why you know what is it you're feeling what is it about the sound that makes you feel that way and then I think in you know when people mature in their ability to appreciate art it's also to appreciate not just the pleasant but also the things that make you think that make you uncomfortable um, that challenge you. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's so much riches there as well. That is so good, Joan. I'm, I'm, I'm right now. All that. Okay. Um, all right. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you so much you. for coming today and taking a chance on us, trying something new that we hadn't done before. And, making it all work and come together. And um, I'll be sending you the modules. And, you know, if you if you want to use those or make your own version, that's perfectly fine. And um, we'll be back in touch with you about the pilot. And, um, you know, if, if Lisa, if you find anybody else at your school that you would want to do anything with you, like if you're a music teacher and one Zooms with me, you can call me, you can email me. I usually develop all my pieces with my classroom teachers. Okay. Okay. All right. So they'd be great um, collaborators as well. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much for Peter for taking a whole entire day as well as June out of your um, other lives to be present for this training. Thank you, Sarah and Lisa, for sharing your summer with us. And to all those that were there this morning that'll be watching the ending, ending of this video and to anybody who wasn't able to attend but will still sit through this, thank you so much for everything. And we look forward to the, this, the future possibilities are endless with yes. my first four. So let's just keep it going and tell everybody you know so that we get as many people on board as possible, okay? All thank right, you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your summer and talk to me anytime, okay? Sounds All right. Good. Thank you, Cece. Bye. 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 Bye.